Oh, good evening, everyone, and greetings from Nazarene Theological College in Manchester in the United Kingdom, and welcome to the 2023 Didsbury Lectures. To uh, those of you here uh, in the room, to those of you joining us online, and to those of you watching uh, the recording of uh, these lectures later. I'm Jordan Hammond, and in this setting, I'm helping to introduce the lectures, this year's lectures, as director of research here at NTC. This is the 45th annual series of Didsbury Lectures. The Didsbury Lectures were inaugurated in 1979 by Professor F.F. F. Bruce, and he's been followed annually by highly regarded scholars who have established the series' academic standard. All have been notable for their high caliber scholarship uh, and also making that scholarship accessible to a wide ranging audience. Whenever possible, the lectures have been published, usually in recent years by Cascade Books, an imprint of Whip and Stock that fits well with the series' aim of publishing theology books that combine academic rigor with broad appeal and accessibility. Uh, most recently, the 2020 Didsbury Lectures, I have a copy here, have been published uh, in the series, uh, the lectures that were given by John Swinton uh, under the title, uh, Deliver Us From Evil, A Call for Christians to Take Evil Seriously. This year, we have the rare privilege to welcome an international lecturer, Dr. Amos Young, who serves as professor of theology and mission at my alma mater, Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. Amos was born in Malaysia and uh, his parents immigrated to the United States. He has been married to Alma for 36 years and has three children and six grandchildren. Now, it's not really a possible task to adequately summarize the remarkable ongoing fruits of Professor Young's scholarship and service to the church. Now, I trust that uh, many of you will be inspired by these lectures to engage or continue to engage with his varied work. He has expertise and has published in global Pentecostalism, theology and science, theology and mission, political theology, systematic and constructive theology, comparative theology, theology of religions, interfaith encounter and dialogue, and Buddhist Christian dialogue, and has authored or edited more than 50 books and over 200 articles. Uh, we have many of these books uh, available uh, back on the book foyer, and so they'll be there all week, and so I encourage you to have uh, a look at them. Uh, one good way to get into uh, the breadth of his work is uh, an Amos Young reader, um, The Pentecostal Spirit, and that contains selections of his writings, and so if you want to explore some of the range of his writings, that's a good place to go. Um, he's amongst his most uh, recent books, I'll just mention two of the most recent ones which have been published uh, very recently. Um, one is Uncovering the Pearl, the Hidden Story of Christianity in Asia, uh, edited with Mark Lamport and Timothy Lim in Cascade's Global Story of Christianity series. Uh, and another um, authored with Dale Coulter, The Holy Spirit and Higher Education, Renewing the Christian University. Uh, and before I um, invite Professor Young to deliver his lectures, um, for those of you who are Twitter users, I'm told to, to use hashtag Didsbury Lectures 23 if you want to um, comment about the lectures and have conversation that way. So uh, I now invite Professor Young as our 45th Didsbury lecturer to address his topic, Jesus in Cartographic Perspective, Mapping Christian Practice, Thinking, and Feeling 
after Pentecost. Thank you, Dr. Hammond, so much for the introduction. Thank you all for clapping, for being here, as well as those of you that are logging in from wherever you may be at. And it's also my privilege to be here in Manchester, here at Nazarene Theological College, and to be a part of this series, uh, of which a number of books that have been published over the decades I have read as well. So I'm delighted to uh, be a part of this conversation. <clears throat> this evening, we will get started with um, sort of some introductory remarks to frame what I'll be speaking about more tomorrow and Wednesday and Thursday. This will, the combined uh, few days and these four lectures constitute what I hope and pray and anticipate will be part one of a work on Christology that as of tonight, I'm formally beginning. Part two, I'll talk about more in a few moments, will not take place for a while, but uh, we will look for those opportunities as they come. Tonight, I want to therefore set the stage for the rest of this week. I want to do that by introducing this cartographic approach, take up some questions in critical cartography, and then frame what we will be discussing. So the first thing that we will look to do is to introduce the approach. I wanna do that by discussing what it means to conduct a mapping of Jesus. Take up questions considering what that mapping entails of Jesus, the mapping of the sources related to what we want to do, and then also transition a bit to mapping Christology, distinct and relate, but yet related as well. In this first part of tonight's talk, we're gonna look specifically at Jesus as the subject of mapping. Well, so we will attempt to, in that respect, map Jesus. First question then that we would want to ask is, who is Jesus? Right? That's uh, the Christological question at a certain level. And of course, that question leads us right to the first time it was asked in the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus turns to Peter and asks, who do you say that I am? And of course, we can dive deep into that particular question in the particular context of Matthew 16 and clarify how that question illuminates Jesus, at least in relationship to Peter and under Peter or beneath Peter, the broader Matthean community context. The question directed to Peter results in a conversation that conversation is situated amidst the broader gospel of Matthew. So that the question of who do you say that I am is both a question to Peter, but also a question to the Matthean community. And because we read that question in Matthew 16, any readers of Matthew's gospel begin to participate in that question have an opportunity to respond to that question. And no doubt, they and you and I have also attempted to respond to that question in our own ways. So all of a sudden, the question of who do you say that I am, who Jesus is, becomes a multi-leveled set of questions, a multi-leveled set of responses, and that's why we need maps to help us to trace and track the different levels different trajectories of responses that may emerge. And we also know, of course, that the Peter's response, the Petrine response of Matthew 16, which is situated amidst the Matthean response or the, the responses of the Matthean community, sit alongside uh, what we have inherited as multiple portraits of Jesus. 
And for myself, I've spent more of my life studying the third gospel, Luke's gospel. So I've been responding to that question, who do you say I am? Not necessarily directly in conversation with Matthew and what is there, but more in conversation with Luke and what is there. So any of us who might engage Peter's question or Matthew's question will do so from the perspectives or the experiences or the locatedness of where we are at as individuals and as individuals in communities. And we will come to that question in Matthew 16 from a lot of different directions. Which then, of course, raises the question, you know, how can we map Jesus in all of these complex ways within which responses to the question have been registered? And the deeper question that I think lies underneath that is in that sense, well, why bother with the mapping at all? Like, who would be interested in hearing Peter's response and the response of the Matthean community and the response of people that read that text from whatever other perspectives and experiences that they bring to their reading and then to their response. Why map Jesus? Why provide mappings? Are we just merely curious? We're probably too busy to trace all the maps. Um, are we wanting to be simply more informed? But why? Perhaps for most of us, uh, the question of why map Jesus, why understand Jesus, why understand Jesus and all of the complexities of responses that that question has generated over time, probably for most of us, our response is not only because we want to know, but because we are disciples. Or we want to be faithful disciples, most of us in this space. Yes, yes, there will be others outside the Christian community that might be interested in mappings of Jesus for their own reasons. Maybe they are apologetic, sort of against, uh, to develop their own responses to answer to Christian witness. But for us, it might be that we want to be more faithful disciples. And in particular, I think, for those of us here at Nazarene Theological College, especially those in postgraduate programs, we also probably have our own deeper theological interests that might lead us to ask these questions and attempt to map some of the responses. I want to stay for a couple moments, however, on mapping the sources of the question, who is Jesus and of Christology. We've already mentioned that the New Testament, and in particular, the Gospel of Matthew. I've mentioned the Gospel of Luke. We, we know, of course, that there are four Gospels. There are, in other words, or there is, in other words, the canon of the New Testament that provides us with some of the primary sources to construct our initial maps of Jesus. The Gospels provide us with maps of who he was uh, as a Nazarene. Although the Gospels provide us that perspective, of course, from later generational viewpoints. We'll come to that in a second. The letters of the New Testament provide us with windows, maps into who Jesus is, if you will, for those communities whenever they were written, whether it was some of the Pauline letters in the 50s, some of the later letters, perhaps in the latter part of the second, uh, of the first century. And the apocalypse, for an, an, to take another text in the New Testament, then provide us with a glimpse of who he will be, the Jesus that is coming. Of course, there are other texts in the New Testament that give us that, these, these various temporal dimensions, who he was, who he is, and who he will be. 
So again, even the sources themselves already in just this very brief way open up to a different trajectories of maps. Some that reflect a little bit backward, some that reflect more upon what is happening in a particular space and time, some that anticipate how the world might be, as well as how the Jesus who will return will be in that return. That's, if we were to read these texts, will tell us all of what I've just summarized, plus a lot more. Of course, everything I'm saying can be elaborated upon, and I will over the next few days. But it's not only what the texts say that is important for us to map Jesus, but it's also, and I therefore put these, the NT in quotes, that the texts themselves emerge out of context. The texts themselves and what they say are said in certain contexts to address the issues of what the letters address or what the communities are engaging in. In other words, there is a world behind these texts. So on the one hand, the texts give us a window into who Jesus was, is, and will be. At the level of the world behind the texts, they also invite us to consider why things are said about who Jesus was and is and will be in light of the world behind the text. And finally, or not finally, but not only is there a world behind the text, but we also know that there's a world in front of the text. The readers to whom the texts were addressed initially, readers of subsequent generations, reaching up to us as readers today, so there's a reception history to these texts. Our mappings of Jesus, therefore, are, are invitations to study these primary sources and what they say. They're an invitation to study the worlds behind these texts that have generated these primary sources. And they're invitations also to map subsequent generations' readings receptions and responses to these texts, producing the variety of Christologies that we have received. When we ask, therefore, about mapping Christologies, I'm thinking particularly now about and I'm not wanting here to bifurcate the historical Jesus from the Christ of faith, although I think there are a lot of different ways in which we can talk about the relationship between the two. But for our purposes, I do want to, and I will usually refer to Jesus as the person from Nazareth and the Christologies as our second order considerations, beginning with our doctrinal and confessional Christologies. We will spend some time on Wednesday looking at Nicaea and Chalcedon and assessing those Christologies, understanding, mapping how they have functioned. But our Christologies, or in mapping our Christologies, were mapping doctrinal and confessional responses, responses of communities uh, that have this confessional, creedal, if you will, conciliar in other respects, dimensions. Which means that we, in mapping Christologies, are mapping later generations' responses to the question, who do we say, who do you say that I am? Related to that, we are also, in that respect, mapping not just later generations' responses to the question of who Jesus is, but we will also see, and I, I am sure we realize, embedded in that response or those sets of responses, or implicit or explicit, both implicit and explicit in those responses, include concerns for the existential or soteriological issues that 
the Christ question also brings into focus. In other words, I think we're, we will see and most of us realize that the question of who do you say that I am was never merely just an abstract question about who is this guy? But it was and always has been a question of significance and meaning. And in particular, significance and meaning for us and our salvation. So there's this soteriological dimension to the Jesus question. Mapping Christologies is therefore mapping responses to who Jesus is and what did he do exactly? What was accomplished? Why was who he was significant for us? That's the uh, related existential or soteriological set of questions. And related to that, I believe, also is we, what we might call the, the eschatological dimension of the question, who do you say that I am? Which is connected to the existential and the soteriological question. Because the question of salvation has to do not only with experiencing that today for us, but it's the question of what does that mean tomorrow? What do we have to hope for? What do we get to hope for? The questions involved, therefore, not only who Jesus was and what he did, but what hope did Jesus inspire? What hope does he, what hope does he continue to inspire? So mapping Christologies, I think we will see, involves mapping these various confessional, doctrinal, existential, practical, soteriological, and eschatological questions, the, the deepest and perhaps most anxious questions we have concern, what about tomorrow? What's gonna happen? What's that going to bring? And how does the response to the question, who do you say that I am, shed some light, map that trajectory into that unknown future? Okay, so we've sort of sketched the surface of mapping Jesus, Jesus as the subject under the cartographic gaze. I want to now turn to talking a little bit about maps and mapping. I want to consider this metaphor of map for a few moments. I want to understand a little bit the discipline of cartography. We'll spend some time, a little bit of time on that. We'll look a little bit at some of the uh, current debates and considerations in cartography. And then in the second part of this introductory talk, we will look at some cartographic considerations in the study of religion to seg our way back in the theology before the end of tonight. So if in these first few moments we've looked at mapping Jesus as subject, I want to get in the last part of tonight to Jesus mapping. I'm sorry, if in the first moments we consider mapping Jesus as the object of maps, I want in the last part to get to the topic of Jesus mapping, Jesus being the subject, uh, the, ob the object through which we see the world. And in the midst of this, I want to look at the conversations in cartography more specifically. So let's introduce uh, some of the basic elements of cartography or map making or map usage. All right. <clears throat> I think most of us uh, today uh, live in, well in the US we call it a GPS world, global positioning systems, and in Europe you call it the satellite navigation, sat nav, right? How do we think about maps before and after the GPS or 
satellite navigation. Now, the satellite navigation system involves dozens of satellites around the globe. We, with our reception devices, as long as we can connect to at least three or four of the satellites that feeds into the um, ground control station, so there's a triangulation between us as device users with the signals from multiple satellites and their ground controls to give us then fairly accurate locations within the geographic spaces that we are all navigating. So for most of us now, handheld maps probably isn't something that we regularly consult. Some of us can remember the days when we consulted handheld maps much more regularly, and there's still plenty of them. And we will talk about the differences between <coughs> digital and printed maps as we go. I think the point of the GPS, the SatNav, is that it's quite interactive, as you know. There's all kinds of ways in which you, as the user, can utilize these ma mapping capacities. And there are all kinds of ways in which you, as you and I, as users, can also contribute to the details of the maps and how that's generated. I'll give you one example. Uh, in the US, I frequently use my Gas Buddy application. Uh, the Gas Buddy application is where you're driving around in a place that you're not familiar with and you need to find gasoline for your vehicle. In my case, we have a hydrogen fuel cell and so we need to find a station that has hydrogen fuel to it. And so if I'm not in a place where I'm familiar with, I'll pull up my gas buddy application and I'll type in, I'll say, find me a gas station. Or I'll pull up my hydrogen fuel uh, station map and look for the same thing. And when I get sometimes to the hydrogen fuel station, I'll see that it is out of service. And I can enter into the application that in this case, at this point, the fuel is not dispensing. That way, if somebody else pulls up information for that station five minutes later, they will see that five minutes ago, it was reported that that fuel station was not dispensing. So don't bother going there. Okay, so you can, you can contribute to the knowledge base of what is happening at different locations and sites. No doubt many of you have used uh, in these apps ways to register your delight or your disgust with the restaurant that you're at. And it shows up, right? with the different stars and ratings that you might have registered. So it's very interactive today. Maps, however, again, both historically in the printed forms as well as digitally and interactively, by and large have some basic functions. They include the naming of the what of sites. Right. So, Whatever map we're looking at, or even a digital map that you might pull up, I might pull up a map and I might say, give me the best breakfast restaurants in town, or close to me, if I'm at a place that I'm not familiar with. And what will pop up would be these restaurants, and they'll tell me where to go. So maps name sites, geographic sites, locations. Maps also in that respect, not only name, but they also, that's the, the what, but they also, they, they guide, they orient. They provide direction to the where. The names appear, and then you say, how do I get there? You press a button, and then it guides you to where you, need, where you said you wanted to go. Maps name, the what's. 
they guide us to the where's. And in that respect, maps also distinguish. They now more and more because of the, the interface dimensions um, and the interactive dimensions, they distinguish according to your preferences. What are the best breakfast restaurants right now close to me? They help name and distinguish some of that. But they distinguish also by <clears throat> establishing relationships, establishing relational uh, registers for spaces, establishing relationships of categories and types. So again, best breakfast restaurant close to me. That's a set of designations. And in that respect, they not only name and orient, but they shape the way in which we inhabit our spaces, right? They help us to imagine, not just moving in certain directions, but locating ourselves in certain types of spaces. Any of you that have moved recently will probably have used a variety of different mapping capacities. What's, you know, what are the housing areas like? What are the schools like? What are the business, what's the zoning like? These are all the ways in which cartographic aids enable us to imagine a way of being in the world because they organize the differentiated landscape. They allow us to situate ourselves amidst how far is this from, you know, from the nearest bus route or train route or airport or you name it, right? All the different ways in which we imagine spatiality are captured by our maps. <clears throat> I want to spend a few moments now on some of the task of reimagining cartography in which we work, are working toward what one political geographer calls a spatial hermeneutic. Let's follow how the cartographic conversation has unfolded over the last generation or two. If we observe the debates among cartographers of how maps work. So you can imagine that a more, uh, there was a time in which the rule of maps pertained to their capacity to if you will objectively define geographic spaces. Whereas in our time, uh, I'm usually more comfortable with late modern, but postmodern for some of us as well. Maps are probably looked at in terms of their fluidity. The saying, a map is dated as soon as it is published something else would have been built. A road would have been redirected. Um, a site would have been transformed. And that's in part why even the GPS though, sometimes it takes a little bit for information to catch up, right? In terms of the sat nav. Reliance upon it completely, you end up taking a turn that says, well, this wasn't there, <laughs> right? So maps are not as objective as we might have once thought. Ah, they're not totally subjective, but they're dynamic. They're useful, but they're dynamic. Um, the power uh, to create maps has also been, question, uh, been, been considered. Who gets to produce maps? And what are the purposes? How often is it that those who are being mapped have little say-so in what maps are produced? 
how often do those who are being mapped uh, often find the representation of their spaces to be less or maybe even completely unrecognizable from because these maps have been produced by those outside their communities. In other words, who produces maps for what purposes means that spaces that are mapped oftentimes are mapped to address the purposes of those who are producing it more so than the purposes of those whose ways of lives are being registered on those maps. Therefore, within the cartographic conversation, there have been what some cartographers have called the crisis of cartographical representation. And others have called the cartographical anxiety. Can we really trust these things after all? Or is it all the will to power in which maps are produced for foreign and alien purposes and now we are coming to realize that there is as much that is hidden in the maps that we use as there are the realities in the spaces that maps cover. So critical cartography has begin, begun to raise some of these questions. Whose map? And in what socio-political context is this map being generated? What is in a map? Why do we find what is in the maps that we see there? Why don't we find other things in the maps that we might see? What's missing from these maps? Why are they missing from these maps? And therefore, it comes back to the question of why is any map being generated? By whom? For what purpose? More and more now in a digital age, we are therefore seeing that communities before that may not have had much access to or capacity to produce maps of their spaces are now it's easier for any community to produce a map of their territory, if you will. Some of these maps are oppositional to the maps of the dominant society produced by activists, produced for practical purposes to lift up what happens in certain spaces that are occluded by more authoritative maps produced by those outside those communities. Critical cartographers are therefore interested in who is producing maps, why maps are being produced, and how do we ensure, how do we ensure that the people who are being mapped have opportunities to register their perspectives on map production. So from that perspective, um, I want to introduce the work of Edward Soja, who is a urbanist and political geographer, who has developed this idea of a geographical hermeneutic, or also what he calls a spatial hermeneutic. How do maps work? Soja asks us. Maps work by enabling engagement with our spatial world. From that perspective, mapping, in all of its complexity, gives us tools to access human spatiality. The contrast would be the historian helps us to tell a story of human temporality the narratives of the sequence of our lives or the lives of our communities or of our tradition. A geographical or spatial hermeneutic, however, 
gives us a point of entry to the whole. So think about the ways in which, let's say we map the world, or a continent, or a nation, or Manchester, or maybe there's a map of Didsbury, right? Any one of these mappings, if you will, are, uh, they exist in principle amidst the broader geographic mapping, right? And just like you and I would use the sat-nav or the GPS, we can sort of using our thumbs and fingers, zoom in and, and get a little clarity, more and more clarity, and, and maybe too much we can zoom back out and we want to see more. We want to see more in multiple ways, more breadth and maybe more depth as well. A geographical hermeneutic, therefore, gives us both the whole at one time and yet invites multiple entries into any site. And those multiple entries, of course, can be told, it gives us a geographic spatial perspective that can also answer the question of historicity and temporality, right? Um, this location before 1959, if I understand it correctly. There was probably something else here. And maps of 1958 might name that a little bit differently, and so on. A geographic or spatial hermeneutic therefore allows for a certain kind of simultaneity. It also allows for a certain kind of transparency in theory and in principle, you can go further and deeper into any site that you desire to or need to, that the purposes invite or require you to. But a geographic or spatial hermeneutic also operates as well as it does because of its opacity. It, uh, the, the simultaneity of seeing the globe um, requires a certain level of abstraction, a certain level of vision, right? Uh, the more that we want to zoom in, that means that, uh, so in other words, to stay at that level, we have to be comfortable with the opacity of what the map involves. I will come back to this spatial or geographic hermeneutic in a few moments and throughout our time together. But for now, um, I want to then ask the question, how is it that these geographic or cartographical considerations uh, inform our thinking about religion for the moment? I want to frame it in terms of to what degree have we developed cartographies of religion or to what degree also are we, or have we been invited to engage in developing religious cartographies? This maps onto uh, where this first lecture has been going, right? We started with maps of Jesus, cartographies of Jesus, cartographies of religion. We're then thinking about uh, Jesus as providing the lenses for mapping religious cartographies. How have those been uh, engaged in? Yeah. All right. So there are, as you can well imagine, multiple um, ways in which this question has been engaged in over the last generation. One approach, uh, generally, I think, covering uh, a range of possibilities is what I would call the map is territory approach. This will be the possibility of a, what we might call a realist cartography of religion, meaning mapping religion and religiosities uh, with some degree of accuracy. 
where the mappings are therefore give us reliable, trustworthy, dependable, ob objective, if you will, perspective on the re religious lives, worlds, and so on, right? Um, more and more, particularly because of the NAVSAT and, and so on, um, aerial ph photographs are turned over into maps. And you might say, hey, an aerial photograph, that gives us as objective a perspective on the territory as, as we might ever be, be uh, um, interested in, in having or in, in looking at. And yet, isn't it the case? If you've seen some of these aerial photographs of territories of Manchester, right? Or just peek out of the airplane every once in a while when you're coming in, <laughs> coming in for a landing, right? You might be familiar with some of the sites, but again, if you're just looking down at the whole, all of the details, even the aerial photograph needs an interpretation. Otherwise, it's just a blur of what? Buildings, green patches, brown ones, and so on. Okay? So, yes, again, it's not, that's why I have the question mark here, right? Um, Matt, is territory? No one's going to deny that the aerial photograph gives us a very accurate map, but its accuracy is only at the level of. Uh, it's only the level of, of um, if you will, the spatial relationships. The aerial photograph doesn't tell us anything else about what's down there. Geographer David Turnbull therefore says that, well, yeah, maps are territories, but only when nature and culture are viewed to be simultaneously present. Take all the aerial photographs you want, you'll still need interpretation culture to give meaning to these maps. Maps in that respect need narratives. I'm reminded of, for instance, philosopher Richard Rorty's argument in Philosophy and the Mirror of Nature, that behind every proposition is a narrative. And sometimes, maybe often, the narrative becomes more significant. The proposition is not comprehensible apart from it. In that respect, yeah, philosophy might mirror reality in some respect, but only as narrated, only as interpreted. So let's, be, okay, we'll hold for a moment this possibility of a realist cartography of religion and Maybe we switch over on the other side. We'll say, oh, maps aren't territories. Uh, is this something like uh, what we might say is an idealist cartographic approach to religiosity? Where maps of religions and religious lives and religious realities are idealizations only? Geographer and cultural theorist Jeff King argues that maps in that respect always precede territories. In fact, the argument here would be that the maps that we have actually help us to engage these territories to begin with. Again, I am not now wanting to put all of our eggs in the basket of an idealist approach to cartography. Jonathan Z. Smith, in a very influential essay from the mid-1970s titled, Map is Not a Territory, made the argument in light of the ways in which um, colonial representations of the other contributed to what Said and others regarding the Orientalist thesis had argued, right? That maps are not territories in the sense that they are oftentimes wielded as instruments of power. 
For Smith, as a religious studies scholar, however, that did not mean let's do away with maps because, as King had argued, and I suggested a moment ago, these maps yield consequences. They have efficacies. The usage of maps enables those who use them to do things with them. So what do we do? We recognize the incompleteness of our maps. We recognize that maps are instruments of power. We recognize that we need multiple maps in order for us to get a richer perspective on what we're trying to understand. And for Smith and for scholars of religion since Smith's time, it justifies being a scholar of religion to produce more mappings, helpful, more helpful mappings, better mappings. So I would say that sort of carving sort of a middle space between these, maps in that respect would always follow territories. I would want to invite a, you might say, a critical realist, religious cartography. There is no such thing merely as a map of religiosity. There's always going to be also a religious investment in that mapping. And that religious investment in that mapping will inform the development of the maps, the map, the maps. That the fact, therefore, that any cartographies of religion are also, in some or other respect, religious cartographies, and therefore, that religious cartography can be complemented by an anthropological cartography, an economic cartography, a political cartography, a, you see, the religious cartography can be complemented, supported. So in that respect, our maps are always fallible, they're finite, they're perspectival, they invite further mapping, they're dynamic in that respect, which is a good thing. Even while they are also always performative, they enact a certain way of engaging the spaces that we inhabit and that we navigate, right? So we'll never have a final map. That begs the eschatological question, but just stay with me for a moment. But we will have, and we do have maps that we function by and with, and we can argue. How functional are they? Um, how, how helpful are some of the maps we have now? Um, how can our maps be better produced to enable greater functionality, to minimize the distortions, the occlusions of the ex extant maps that we have? So, and the last part now of, I'm going to try to hurry through this here. It's a little bit difficult for me to see the clock, so, but I'm going to do what I can to bring this home here. Um, in the last part now, I want to say Jesus mapping. I'm not interested only in mapping Jesus as an object. I'm interested in how Jesus helps us map. Jesus as the subject of our mapping. And in that respect, I'm also interested in what I'm going to call a Christological cartography, right? So in other words, I'm not interested only in our cartography of Christology, a mapping of Christologies, and we will do some of that. But I'm interested also in a Christological cartography, a way of mapping that is Christic and informed by Jesus, right? And John 14, 6 invites me and us, you're stuck captives in this lecture series, so stay with me. He's the, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Right? So I'm interested in, in that respect, um, how 
John 14, 6 helps us to ask the fundamentally important questions of how does Jesus show us the way? How does Jesus show us the truth? And how does Jesus show us life? In that respect, I'm interested in Christological cartographies of what we do, our practices, our actions, our behaviors, what we do with our hands and our feet. I'm also interested in how we think, what we think, and how we think. Uh, not only does Jesus show us the way, the right way, the right paths, the right practices, orthopraxis. Jesus also shows us the truth, the right truths, the right ways to the truth, the right paths to the truth, orthopistis, the right ways toward confession, the right paths toward the seeking of understanding. Not only does Jesus show us the ways of practice to change the world, to love God and love neighbor, not only does Jesus show us the truth of our confessions, but Jesus also shows us about life, reveals life. I invite us to think in this respect of how Jesus provides a map for our affectivity our bios, our embodiment, our passions, our loves, our fears, our hates, our hopes, our longings, our yearnings. I hope in a place like Nazarene Theological Seminary that one's heart can still be strangely warmed and that that level of heart devotion and piety is not just incidental or marginal to Christian practice and Christian confession. John Tyson's recent book on Charles Wesley's Christology was all about the Christology of the hymns. Lex orandi, lex credendi. We confess Jesus not because we've memorized a creed, but because we've memorized these hymns. We have sung them over and over again. Orthopathos, Edwards's religious affections, slightly preceding Wesley on the other side of the pond, tells us a lot about the role of affectivity in the religious life. Edwards' Christology is much less systematic, kind of like Wesley's. Neither one of them wrote a systematic Christology, thank God. Certainly for Edwards, Christology or Christ provided one of the dozen most important criteria for discerning orthopathos, a right passions, right affections. His Christology, however, was much more abstract. And yet, I think for both Edwards and Wesley, they have given us windows into this way of Jesus that is also this life of Jesus. Pietisms, do you love Jesus? Being perhaps the most important of the questions that we might want to ask about Christologically. So, I want to, for the rest of this week, develop what I would call a spatial Christological cartography. How do we see and navigate the world? Practice, thinking, and feeling in light of Jesus. How does Jesus help us to map Christian practice, thinking, and feeling. And in that respect, our spatial hermeneutic operates hermeneutically and methodologically for us. 
While I will be deploying primarily historical sources over the next few days, not a historian. And I'm applying a geographic hermeneutical approach. One that I will therefore invite you to peer back through certain windows of my choosing that I will present in order to explore the landscape of Christian practice, Christian thinking, and Christian feeling. And this will invite us and give us an opportunity to delve a little deeper in certain, in certain moments, in, into certain spaces, or it allows us to, to step back a little further because we want to have a broader regional landscape upon which to gaze at, understand, and be interrogated by what the ground tells us is happening. The various sites, therefore, that I will bring to our attention uh, do not need to be locked into a any kind of a sequence. I suppose that's my prerogative as a systematic theologian. But I do hope that they provide us with important moments, sites, for thinking about our practice, our theologizing, and our feeling, our affectivity. I believe that they invite us in that respect to what a Christological orthodoxy. So what I hope that we can discuss over the next few days is what is the cartography of an orthodox Christology? So again, we're going back and forth between mapping Jesus, mapping our Christologies, but on the other hand, having Jesus provide the maps for that orthodoxy. And again, I'm using John 14, 6, right? What is orthodoxy? It's the combination of orthopraxis, orthopistis, and orthopathos. And as we spend moments on these landscapes of historic Christian practice, historic Christian thinking, and historic Christian feeling, I'm hoping that what will emerge in this Christological cartography is an orthodox way of practicing, believing, and feeling in the world. Now, there will be, again, a plurality of, the, of texts and, and individuals and events that we will zoom in here and zoom out there. But that's what the spatial hermeneutic allows for and gives us the capacity to wield. It allows us to zoom in on how we have loved and known and followed Jesus. Again, as invitations for further study, more intentional practice, and more deeper loving of God. Now, Amidst all of this, um, there are some normative dimensions to this. This is not just an ad hoc historical buffet that, even though sometimes it might feel like that for the next few days, but there are some normative dimensions of my um, cartographical Christology, Christo, Christological uh, hermeneutic. And most importantly, I'll, I'll highlight a couple. It's after Pentecost. So I'm not going to say too much about Pentecostal theology in these next few days, but some of you will probably be able to detect. I've been working as a Pentecostal theologian for 25 years, so it's probably going to come out. <laughs> My invitation is simply that any constructive Christology happens after Pentecost. No constructive Christology occurs prior to Pentecost. Jesus 
is the Messiah and therefore the anointed one by the Spirit. And in that respect, any constructive theology after Pentecost is Pentecostal, not in the 21st century sense of Pentecostal, but in the apostolic sense of the spirit that anointed the man from Nazareth is with us on our journey, our cartographic exploration, poured out as she is upon all, not just the ones with the cartographic power, Last points I'll make for tonight, map these lectures Christologically. We hope to feel and know and navigate the world better. For the next three nights, I'm going to look tomorrow at orthopraxis. How has images of Jesus, understandings of Jesus, fueled Christian doing, Christian practice, Christian Mission, Christian witness, historically. On Wednesday, we shift to how have Christian understandings, Christian confessions um, led to understandings of the person and work of Christ, our doctrines, our theologies of Christ. On Thursday, we will look at how Jesus Christ has informed our right and not so right affectivity, our feelings, our embodied responses. Now, again, for our purposes, and uh, geographic and spatial hermeneutic allows us to choose the frames within which we are exploring the territory. I am choosing to divide these lectures in these ways, moving from orthopraxis to orthopistis to orthopathos. Granted, those are fairly arbitrary. They could have gone in other directions. I will say more over the next few days about why I have chosen this specific approach. Precisely though, because they can go in multiple directions, every lecture that, is, that precedes begs the other lectures that have yet to come, and vice versa. Now, part two of my Christological cartography will take up more normative questions. I've already given a bit of that tonight. Again, the next few days, I'm going to focus primarily on some historical snapshots into landscapes. Part two of my Christology will take up more normative questions, but remain engaged with orthopathos, orthodoxy, uh, orthopistis, and orthopraxis in 21st century context. I will be giving a set of lectures next October, in which, God willing, part two of these lectures uh, by Christology will be developed. So if you want the whole, you're probably either going to have to log in for that one, or you'll have to wait until that is published, which won't be for, hopefully before Jesus comes back. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, again, because of the interrelatedness between a cartography of religion and a religious cartography, or a cartography of Christology and Christological cartographies, that the normative and the historical are always intertwined, right? So we'll have to, these next few days, we'll have to sort of discern where are some of these normative assumptions embedded in what is being presented. And for those folks that listen to me next year, they'll have to figure out what the historical trajectories are. <clears throat> Last thing I'll say, um, next three nights, we will begin each night with what I call apostolic mappings mappings of apostolic orthopraxis, orthopistis, and ortho, orthopathos, orthopathy, looking uh, in, in large part at scriptural New Testament uh, ways in which these 
give windows into Christ and allow us Christic windows into these aspects. We'll always be asking the questions, how do these Christological perspectives and spaces and sites allow us to see, to know, and to feel better? Thank you. giving us that initial mapping of the landscape for your lectures and really setting up the rest of the series nicely, uh, as well as uh, your, your wider project. So we have uh, just a few minutes, maybe for a couple of questions, uh, which could come from the audience here, or uh, potentially uh, we welcome questions also uh, to be submitted, to be written for uh, those of you who are following online. So, uh, anyone want to start with a question? Yes, Robert, uh, come, come up so that uh, everybody is able to hear well. Um, this is possibly a bit mischievous, but your GPS metaphor, your GPS metaphor, Global positioning depends on multiple satellites. Your map metaphor permits multiple projections, none of which is perfect or total. Seems like quite a good argument for polytheism. Why are we privileging the Christ cartography? Well, I'm not writing a theology of polytheism for this, so that's probably the most direct answer. I've been thinking about Christology for a long time, and I haven't written a Christology. So when this opportunity came, and however long ago it came, I thought it might be a good time to start working on that. To your point, however, um, my Pentecost approach is poly a lot of things. The many tongues invite the manyness of take your pick. At one point, I'm being now not mischievous in response, but at one point I did wonder about what would, how do we think about polytheism in light of scripture? and the, the, the current human condition. Right? And of course, what does polytheism even mean? Many deities in what respects? So um, I guess all that to say is that having spent as much time as I have in theologies of religions and those sorts of things, I actually don't think that the question of polytheism is uh, as ridiculous, although what that involves, I think uh, we can say quite a bit more than what I'm prepared to say for these weeks. Um, and, and I'm not in that, even in that respect, trying to articulate, I guess I would, in, in closing on that front, I would say polytheism is true from the perspective of phenomenology of religion, right? It gives you a certain map into the territory. Uh, of course, we're more interested in, I believe in one God and in the Lord, we'll talk more about that on Wednesday, for instance, so. I'm not sure if that responds to your question, but that's what sparked in my mind for what you asked. <clears throat> Time for maybe one other, if there are any others. Jacob, yes. Well, I'm a, I'm a bit bitter with the concept of mapping recently because I got a notification on Thursday saying a Google review I left for a restaurant a month ago has more views than the book I wrote. It's been 10 years, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, anyways, I'm thinking about, um, in that light, recent conversations in the last 10 or 15 years about s spatial imagery being mastery-oriented. 
and place as a metaphor or place as a concept being more about embodiment and mutual belonging in a place and the ways in which your thesis engages placial concepts like in Derrida and so, so on versus the, the concepts around space and mastery. Thanks. So yeah, I won't be doing a whole lot more theorizing, cartographical theorizing over the next few days. Um, I, I am more interested in sort of the cartographical sort of cap capacities for Christology, right? Now, um, what that means is more so that I'm going to, I believe, hopefully, hopefully, uh, illuminate Christology from some of these cartographical, metaphorical, uh, uh, and, and other uh, tools, so to speak. I am more interested in the ways in which the geographic hermeneutic lifts up, if you will, the ways of lives within which even our thinking takes place, for instance, and our feeling and our doing, right? And from that perspective, I'm very sympathetic to the latter part of what you, of what you had mentioned. And at various places in the next few days, I think that's going to come, come, come through uh, more, more, you know, more, more robustly. In particular, again, from a, a Pentecost, you know, many tongues, many representations, language, its representations as any map needs interpretation, right? So it's, it's then attending to and being able to acknowledge and, and observe and recognize uh, the, the diversity of voices within spaces and how that does sometimes challenge, resist, question, interrogate some of the dominant narratives or Christologies perhaps that we have, that we're shaped by. So I think that's in part where I'm headed. I'm not going to be spending too much more time again getting into the, the, the theoretical sides of the arguments. Okay, well, let's uh, thank uh, Amos for his first night of lectures. Okay, we uh, invite you all back, of course, for uh, the next three nights of lectures at the same time, and also invite you to, to stay, if you can, for conversation and refreshments. There's the, the book stall back there, which you're welcome to, to browse, and uh, on, on your left over here, the door, through the door on the left, uh, there's the cafe, and there refreshments will be served, uh, tea and coffee, and uh, probably biscuits, and so uh, invite all of you to, to stay and engage uh, in further conversation. That will, will happen each night uh, after the lectures. <laughs>